In the previous two videos, we saw how and why we can trick Super Mario Bros. to load in glitched levels by using the game Tennis to corrupt the memory value that keeps track of what world to start on when you hold A and press start on the title screen. If you haven't seen those two videos, I highly suggest you watch those first. Most of the glitch levels are just altered versions of levels that already exist in the game. But in this video, we'll explore the handful of fully glitch levels you can access and why they look the way they do. The root cause for the glitched levels is due to the world number value, which is normally constrained to the range 0 through 7 to correspond to worlds 1 through 8, which can be corrupted to any value from 0 to 255 by tennis. This means that 248 glitched world numbers exist. Each of those glitched world numbers correspond to a level ID that represents the first level in that glitch world. If you remember from the last video, we made this table of all of the possible level IDs, including glitch levels. We can mark off which of these levels correspond to the first level of each world. For example, the first level in world 1 has ID hex 25, the first level in world 2 has ID hex 28, and so on. These are the first levels of the eight intended worlds in the game. If we look at the level ID of the first level in world 9, we get ID hex 06, as shown in the previous video. We can do this for all of the other 247 glitched worlds. You can see that not all of the level IDs get marked. Out of all 128 possible level IDs, only 68 of them are the first level in some world. This means the other 60 are either the second or later level in a world, or just not available in any world at all. Out of the available levels, many of them are just normal levels found in the game, or altered versions of them, such as 9-1 being level 6-2 but underwater, or level 81-1 being level 2-4 with bloopers but underground. But there are some glitched worlds that end up with a glitched level data pointer, which in turn create completely new glitch levels. There are 19 accessible glitch level IDs, but only 6 of them will actually load without crashing instantly. The first of which being level E-1, which is just a lone question block over a giant pit where Mario dies instantly. This exact level is also loaded if you try to start from world 224. Of course, once you get past world 35, or world Z, the level number starts to contain other glitched graphics. This tile corresponds to the number 224. Starting at world W loads in this level, which locks Mario in place and he can't move. Starting at world 42 or 133 lets you play this level, which is full of clouds and eventually traps you if you manage to make it far enough. Even if you're sneaky and use Big Mario to clip through this pipe, you just get stopped by this big wall that you just can't get through. Worlds 62, 131, and 240 trap Mario in this castle where he is also unable to move. The game doesn't let Mario move until he falls down from this high up on the screen, but these two levels that are frozen like this have solid blocks high up, so Mario is unable to ever move at all. World 127 is a small underground tunnel, but it crashes if you go too far down it. And finally, World 137 leads you to a funny level that activates the automatic walking from the underground level cutscene. Unfortunately, Mario eventually meets his worst enemy, a single lone brick block that stops him to the end of time. All of the other world numbers take you either to a normal level in the game, a level from the original game but its type is different, like a castle level turned into an overworld level, or a black screen of death. In the video description, you can find a link to a page that I made that has maps of every level, including glitch levels. Using these maps, you can see what certain levels may look like if you could get past the parts that crash or make Mario stuck in place. This video will focus on why those glitch levels look the way they do. You may be surprised to find out that these levels are as playable as they are, and aren't just a giant mishmash of glitchy tiles all over the place. This is due to the intricate way that the level data is stored in the ROM. 
Like I mentioned in the previous video, the data for the tiles and the data for the sprites are held in different locations, so they are dealt with separately. Let's look at the tile data first. A naive way to store a level's tile data would be to just take all of the tile IDs for the entire level and list them one after another, left to right, top to bottom. This is just wildly inefficient though, since levels are mostly empty space. Level 1-1 is 224 tiles long and 14 tiles high, which equates to 3,136 tiles, which would take about 3 kilobytes to store. There are 8 times 4 levels, so multiply that by 32 and we're looking at around 100 kilobytes just for tile data. The Super Mario Bros. program ROM was only 32 kilobytes big, so that'd be such a waste of space. Instead, larger sets of tiles and groups of blocks are divided up into their own objects. For example, a pipe object, a block staircase, a row of bricks. And then these objects are placed around the world. There are a lot of peculiar and interesting ways that the level data is compressed into this format, however, so I'd like to go over the entire format in this video. The level tile data pointer in that big list for all of the levels points to the level header, which is a pair of bytes that holds information about six properties about the level itself. The highest two bits determine what the timer will start at for this level. If this is set to 0, 0, then the timer will not change, which is used when entering a sublevel. The next three bits determine where Mario starts in the level vertically. Each of the different level types has a different height, but this can be set on a per level basis. Additionally, a value of 111 or 110 will enable auto walking, which is used for the underground level cutscene. The last three bits in the first byte are sort of a modifier for the level type and determine what the default backdrop looks like. This setting will enable the waves at the top of a water level, the brick wall background that you see in 8-3, water waves at the bottom of the level, the nighttime color scheme, the snowy color scheme, the snowy nighttime color scheme, and the nighttime fully gray color scheme that is used in level 6-3. The highest two bits of the second byte will assign properties to the level and will determine what the special platform for this level will be. The default floor block can be the orange rocky brick or clouds, the pipes can be green or orange, and the special platform can be the tree, the mushroom, or the bullet bill cannon. There's only four different combinations here, so you can't really mix and match these options. The next two bits determine the background scenery, which can be nothing, clouds, mountains and bushes, or fences and trees. And the last four bits of the header will control the initial floor pattern, which I'll talk about later. After the header is a big list of every object in the level. Each object takes up two bytes, or 16 bits, and they are just listed one after the other. The special byte hex FD marks the end of the list. Here is the format for each of the objects. The first byte is just the object's position. The higher four bits are its X position, and the lower four bits are its Y position. Now this only covers the range 0 to 15 in each direction, but levels are much longer than 16 blocks long. This is why the highest bit in the second byte is very important. It is called the next screen flag. Essentially, there is a working screen number that starts at 0 when the level first starts. Objects can only be placed on this first screen, which is 16 tiles wide. In order to increase the working screen number, this bit should be set. Then, this object and any after it will be placed on the next screen instead. This means that the objects in this big list have to be ordered in the same order they show up in the level left to right. Only about two screens of a level is loaded into memory at any given time, and the level is deleted behind Mario as he moves through the level, and more level is generated in front of him. This is why you can't go backwards in this game. The code that handles loading the level only knows how to march through the data in one direction. I'll talk more about the level loading routine at the end of this video. 
The next three bits after the next screen bit is the object type. A value of 1 corresponds to that special platform, which depends on the level header. A value of 2 is for brick blocks, 3 is for square blocks, 4 is for coins, all in a horizontal row. A value of 5 is for brick blocks, and 6 is for square blocks, but in a vertical column. For these six object types, the last four bits determine the height or width of the column or row of tiles. Simple enough. A type of 7 is the pipe object. For this object, the bottom three bits are the height of the pipe, but that last bit is used as a flag to determine whether Mario can go in this pipe or not. A completely different object, actually a sprite object, handles where he goes when he enters it, and we'll get to that eventually. This means the standard pipe object can only be up to 8 tiles tall instead of 16. And of course, we're missing object type 0. Object type 0 is a broad group of objects that are only a single thing and don't have a width or height. So when the type is 0, these last four bits actually determine which tile this object is. This is where we find stuff like power-up blocks, hidden blocks, the brown block, flagpole, springboard, and the L-shaped pipe used in the underground level cutscene. It's a single object. Now we're still missing quite a lot of objects that exist in the game. It turns out we can fit a lot more into our format here. Remember how the Y position of the object takes up 4 bits and can range from 0 to 15? The level itself is only 14 tiles high, so there are two Y position values that will never be used. In fact, objects cannot be placed at the very top or the very bottom of the level either, so that leaves us with four extra Y positions that will never be associated with a standard object. Instead, we make special cases for when the Y position is 12, 13, 14, or 15. Now, since we are using the Y position as a sort of indicator, the objects that are identified by these numbers generally either have a fixed Y position, so they always appear in the same vertical position, or they are types of objects that just don't need a vertical position associated with them. For Y position 12, the three bits following the next screen flag are the object subtype, and the other four bits are the width again. Object type 0 here is a hole, which, yes, is its own object. You'll see why holes are objects when we get to the floor pattern thing. Object type 1 is the pulley platform rope, while types 2, 3, and 4 are bridges at various Y positions. Since there is no Y position anymore, the Y position has to be hard-coded into the object type. Object type 5 is a hole with water or lava, and the remaining types 6 and 7 are rows of question blocks at fixed Y positions. Let's look at Y position 15 next, because it follows this exact format, just with more object types. Object types 0 and 1 are the vertical ropes for the platforms that move up and down. Object type 2 is the castle that you see at the start and end of levels. This object is funny because it is only 5 tiles wide, and the large part of the castle is cut off. The walls are built out further using the same brick walls that you find in level 8-3. And the height of the castle can be any value from 0 to 10, but only values 0 and 6 are used in the original game. Object type 3 is an ascending staircase of square blocks. The height and width are the same value, except for when it is 9 tiles wide, where the width is 9 and the height is 8, which is what is used at the end of a lot of levels. There is no object for a descending staircase, so if you want one of those, you have to build it out of a bunch of individual square block objects. Then object type 4 is the big pipe you see at the end of underground levels. Object type 5 is an unused object that is like the flagpole, except the top sphere is repeated all the way down its length. And then type 6 and 7 are empty, unused objects that don't do anything. Y position 13 is split into two subgroups, which is dependent on the bit adjacent to the next screen bit. If this bit is set, then the last six bits are used as another object subtype. Objects that are here include the L-shaped pipe and flagpole again, 
the bridge, axe, and rope that are at the end of each castle, and commands for stopping the screen from moving forward, generating random enemies, and making the level loop. Any object type greater than 11 will likely crash the game. If that one bit is cleared though, then the lower five bits encode a screen skip. Remember how the next screen flag works? It can only advance one screen at a time, and it takes an object to do so. If you want to skip forward more than one screen, you need more than one object with that flag enabled. But this object just encodes a screen number to skip to, so you can go forward more than one screen at a time. Technically, you can also go backwards, since the number encoded here is the screen number with reference to the start of the level, and not the number of screens to skip forward. However, due to how the level loading routine works, that just wouldn't work correctly. One more interesting thing about Y position 13. An object with Y position 13 and X position 15 is not possible. That is because this would encode the byte hex FD as the first byte of this object. This is the cue that the level loading routine uses to mark the end of the tile data, so we can't use it as an object. Finally, we have Y position 14. This object is also split into two subgroups, using that same bit as last time. If this bit is set, then the lower three bits mark a change in the level type modifier. This is the same option that is in the level header, so when this object loads, it will change that level modification. The first four modifications happen instantly, while the palette swaps only take effect if the level is reloaded somehow, like by going through a pipe or dying. These middle three bits go unused. And if that bit is cleared, the next two bits mark a change in the background scenery, again, just like what was in the level header. And the last four bits mark a change in the floor pattern. Finally, we can look at what this floor pattern thing is. A big contributor to the number of blocks in a level is the floor. And if the level is a castle or underground, the ceiling as well. Instead of having separate objects to place each and every floor and ceiling block, the game uses floor patterns to create a sort of base template for the level. For example, the floor pattern of 1 will generate a floor that is 2 blocks tall. The rest of the level will continue to have this floor pattern until another different floor pattern object is in the level data. There are 16 different kinds of floor patterns, ranging from completely empty to completely filled. Just look at how this section of level 1-2 is made. There is a good combination of floor patterns and brick objects that create all of these different shapes. And this is why the whole object exists. It allows the level to have a small gap in the floor without needing to change the floor pattern and back again. Also, if there's a ceiling, the hole won't touch it, since it only removes the lower five tiles of the level. That was how the tile data is formatted, but what about the sprite data? Luckily, it's not as complex. There is no sprite data header, so the sprite level data pointer in the big list of levels just points straight to the first sprite in the level. These work very similarly to the objects in that the X and Y positions are held in the first byte, and the highest bit of the second byte is the next screen bit. Now, objects were barred from being placed at the very top and very bottom of the level, but sprites are allowed to be placed here. So the Y position of the sprites can go from 0 to 13. If this is the case, then the lower 6 bits of the second byte form the sprite type. This list includes basically every enemy, hazard, and moving platform in the game. It also includes some commands for turning on enemy generation, such as Cheep Cheeps, a command that triggers the warp zone to display, as well as the toads and the princess, which are the same sprite. There are also a few sprite types dedicated to spawning a group of enemies so that the number of sprites in the level data could be minimized. This last remaining bit is the hard level flag. Not to be confused with hard mode, which is enabled after beating the game once. If this bit is set, then this sprite will only spawn if the current level is 5-3 or later. This is how the various levels that are repeats but with more enemies are created. 
We still have two y positions we can use for other things, so let's see what's left. Y position 15 is the sprite version of the screen skip command we saw with the objects. The lower five bits are the number that gets set as the working screen. This sprite can't have X position 15, since that would encode the first byte as hex FF, which is what the sprite data uses to denote the end of its list, not hex FD like the object list. This isn't that big of a problem though, since the X position of the screen skip command doesn't really matter. And finally, there is sprite Y position 14. This is used for the special command that determines where Mario should go if he enters a pipe or climbs a vine. The lower seven bits of the second byte encode the seven bit level ID to load when the transition is taken. However, there's even more. This is the only command that takes three bytes instead of two. The lower five bits of the third byte indicate the screen number within that level that Mario will appear. This is how Mario is able to return midway through a level after going into a bonus area. The last three bits here are a bit confusing. They encode the world number where this transition is applicable. Essentially, this transition command will only be processed if this value is the same as the world that Mario is currently in, otherwise it's ignored. The reason why this is a thing is because the underground bonus rooms are used in multiple levels. This first underground bonus room is not just used in level 1-1, but also in levels 2-1 and 7-1. This room has three transition commands, one for each world. This way, Mario reappears in the level he came from, even though this room is used in multiple levels. If you're wondering how the command encodes where within the screen to spawn Mario, here's the thing, it doesn't. When Mario enters a level from somewhere other than the start, there's only two locations he can appear from. The default is coming up from a pipe exactly three tiles to the left of the start of the screen boundary, four tiles from the bottom of the level. All of the levels with a bonus room had to be designed in a way that a pipe was sitting at this location for Mario to come out of. The second location is just appearing at the top of the level, which is used for the underground bonus rooms and returning from a cloudy bonus room. So there is actually a lot of specifications that are assumed by the game's level loading routine when it comes to the level data. That is, it has to be formatted appropriately for the level to be rendered correctly. Of course, all of the intended level data follows these specifications, but when loading glitch levels, or perhaps when trying to edit level data yourself, some of these assumptions can make things go really wrong. The first assumption I already mentioned earlier, all of the tile data objects and sprites must be listed in the order that Mario approaches them from left to right. This is because the game keeps track of what object should be the next one to load, and processes it when the corresponding column is loaded in. So for example, once this question block is loaded in, the next tile object in the list is this row of brick blocks. The game will hold the index of this brick block object in memory until the corresponding column loads in, at which it will switch to the next object in the list, which is this question block. If the objects are out of order, then the corresponding column will never appear, since it already loaded in the past and will not load again. This causes the routine to essentially lock up, and no more tile objects will be able to be processed from this point forward. So for example, if the X position of this question block were changed from 5 to 2, it and the rest of the objects here would not load. The game is waiting for column 2 to load in, but it will never load in since it already did three columns ago. There is one exception that is, which is when the next screen is loaded. When the first column of a new screen is loaded, the game scans forward in the object list until it finds one with the next screen bit set. This will allow it to skip forward to the next screen without locking up. So in practice, when an object is out of order, it causes all of the rest of the objects on that particular screen to fail to load. This is why using the screen skipped object to go backwards in the level won't work properly. All of the objects specified after a backwards jump are all in the past, so to speak, and just won't show up. 
objects that span over more than one column pose a problem. Since all of the tiles are loaded on the fly, if an object takes up more than one tile horizontally, the game has to keep track of that object's data. For example, this five tile wide brick object needs to be kept in memory while the game loads the next four columns. It's only until the last column that the game can forget about it, now that the entire object has been drawn. For this reason, there is a queue system put in place to hold the indices of objects that are currently in the process of being drawn. The level loading routine has two phases. In the first phase, it looks for new objects that start on this column and adds their offset into the object data table into the queue. Then, in the second phase, it processes each object that is in the queue by drawing the appropriate tiles to the screen and removes any objects that end on this column. So all objects end up in the queue at some point, but any objects that are only one tile wide will enter the queue and leave within the same frame. This queue, however, is only three bytes long. This has two big repercussions. First is that the offset of each object is limited to eight bits, meaning there can be a maximum of 128 objects in a single level. The second is that only three objects can ever exist in the same column at once. If the queue ever fills up with three objects, the game will immediately move on to the second phase of drawing those objects, even if there is a fourth object in that column. This results in the same problem as the out of order objects, since that fourth object is now in the past and will never load. This affects all objects, including the floor pattern and scenery change objects, with one exception, which is the screen skip object. Those are always processed and bypass the queue system altogether. This means that the design of every level also has to take into account this fact that you just can't have too many objects stacked on top of one another. For example, you may have noticed this part of 1-2 from earlier. This chunk of blocks is split up into a separate brick column object at the end so that the 1-up block can be placed in the ceiling while still only having three objects in this column. Now, there are some other finicky edge cases that involve combinations of out-of-order objects, more than three objects in a column, and screen skips that can allow for up to five objects to be drawn in a single column, but I'm going to have to leave that for a footnote video since it's extremely nuanced and will take way more time to explain than this video has time for. One last animation I would like to show in this video is how the game processes the level data while you're playing. Like I mentioned before, only two screens of the level are ever loaded in at once. The level is overwritten with new data as it disappears off the left side of the screen. In this animation, when a tile data object is loaded in, the entire object will show up at once but fade it out a bit. It's only when the tiles are truly drawn to the screen do they become fully opaque. And of course, the level disappears behind Mario. I'm only showing level 1-1 here, but you can watch another video I have uploaded that shows off every level in the game. You can click the card that appears on your screen now, and there's also a link in the video description. Thank you for watching, and I hope this series on Super Mario Bros. was interesting. If you want to mess around with the level data and find some of the more obscure intricacies of this format, there does exist a level editor for the game called SMB Utility. It lets you even see the two lists of level data for the objects and sprites as you edit the level by dragging things around. You can even edit objects and sprites manually by modifying their byte entries in the list. It can be a lot of fun to just mess around with.